this gym. So crazy to be here doing this. Indeed, a lot of a lot of fun memories. So stories back here. Opportunity on the horizon. So we are all here tonight for the first public meeting where the Bears will share where they are with the potential purchase of Arlington Park. You will hear from Bears Chairman George Hallis McCaskey, Club President and CEO Ted Phillips, and a host of world-class experts in architecture, land use planning, and community impact about their conceptual plans to fully develop the property. What you will not here about this evening is the stadium. Mm. The stadium planning and discussion will take place down the road if the club closes on and ultimately develops the lane. Damn. Just want to level set with everyone from the outset. That said, after our presentation, we'll turn our attention to your questions and feedback on where the project is today. Now, here's how we're going to collect your questions and feedback. When you walked in tonight, you should have had a pen and a card on your seat which you should use to write your questions up or your feedback. And if you did not receive a card, there are tables in the rear right and left corners of the gym, which have extras. We have ushers on the outside uh, of your seating areas. They'll collect your cards once completed. Simply hand them down to the end of your row where an usher will retrieve them and make sure they get to me. I'll read the questions and feedback and a member of our panel will respond. Now, we expect some of you might ask you similar questions, so those will be aggregated and addressed at one time. Future meetings will have a public remarks option, but tonight, due to the length of the initial presentation, we're going to use the card format to get as many questions as possible before 9 p.m. It is a lengthy presentation, to be sure. And there is a link at the bottom of each card where you can send feedback at any point to the team after this meeting. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the chairman of the Chicago Bears, George Alice McCaskey. Thank you to all of you for taking time out this evening, opening night of the 2022 NFL football season, to be here. I want to stress from the outset that we want to be good neighbors. Ed and Virginia McCaskey settled in Des Plaines in 1949, and our family has been there ever since. Members of the extended McCaskey family live or have lived in Arlington Heights, Schomburg, Palatine, and Mount Prospect. We know the community well, and like you, we want what's best for the community. I should also stress that we are in the very beginning of a process to explore what might be possible at the Arlington Park site. There are still many unknowns, including whether we will be able to close on the property, and if we do, whether we will develop it, and if we do, whether that development will include a stadium. We have a long way to go. There will be ebbs and flows with progress and setbacks. We think development of the site, including a stadium, is a win for Bears fans, the village of Arlington Heights, the surrounding communities, and the state of Illinois. We felt it was important to get in front of you in these early stages to share the progress we've made to date and get your feedback. Because we are early in the process, the answer to many of your questions will be, we don't know yet. But hearing your concerns will be a tremendous help to us as we move forward in our plan. So, how did we get here? First, we were not actively looking for property to develop at the time Arlington Park became available. Churchill Downs reached out to us and asked if we had interest. We recognized this as a unique opportunity that warranted our attention. Our pursuit of a home specific started with my grandfather, George Ellis. In fact, in the 1970s, 
He had his eye on the same site we're talking about tonight. It did not work out then, nor did the many other locations we have looked at in the decades that followed. A tremendous opportunity is present today. But we will need help to make it a reality. We recognize that there is intense interest in a proposed stadium on the site, and that is understandable. However, the stadium and associated parking would make up less than half of the development. Our focus tonight will be on the master plan for the entire site and an initial transportation study for the area. My family and I are not real estate developers. We are not financiers. We are privileged to own a beloved football team that is an important community asset. We take that responsibility to heart. It is our life's passion. We do recognize what might be a once in a lifetime opportunity. That is why we started the process to determine whether we should buy the land and if we are able to close on the land, can we build something that meets our needs and drives long-term economic development for the village, the surrounding communities, and the state? We have hired a great team of experts to help us determine whether there is a path to meet those collective goals. You'll hear from some of them tonight. A number of people at the Bears have worked tirelessly on this project and I'd like to take a moment to publicly acknowledge and thank them in alphabetical order. Scott Hagel, Jake Jones, Karen Murphy, Paul Neurotter, Ted Phillips, Cliff Stein, Lee Twarling, and Tanisha Wade. I want to address the largest hurdle we face, the economics. This is a massive, multi-billion dollar project that could take 10 years or more to complete. If the decision is made to develop the Arlington Park property, it would yield significant economic benefits, including thousands of temporary and long-term jobs and millions of dollars in annual tax revenue. The Bears will seek no public funding for direct stadium structure construction. I'll repeat that. The Bears will seek no public funding for direct stadium structure construction. However, as I mentioned earlier, we will need help. There are broad, long-term public benefits of this project, and we look forward to partnering with the various governmental bodies to secure additional funding and assistance needed to support development of the remainder of the site. How much or what form this will take, we do not know at this time. But we do know that without infrastructure support and property tax certainty, the project as described to you tonight will not, not be able to move forward. If this project is completed, what do we get? A world-class home for the Chicago Bears after a more than 100-year search. What do you get? A world-class facility, parks, houses, restaurants, hotel, and other community
conversations with community leaders, engaging some of the top experts in the business to advise us. We have assembled a team of consultants that are working with us, and tonight you're going to hear from representatives from our master planner, Art Howerton, and our transportation and civil engineering consultant, Kim Lee Horn. But our roster of experts is even more extensive than that. It includes Jones Lang LaSalle, DLA Piper, CAA Icon, Manica, CSL, which is part of Legends, HRNA Advisors, and Goldman Sachs. That team has been working hard at this for a long time to show the seriousness of our intent. We've had inform informative conversations with community leaders, with elected officials, and with Bears fans too. We want to hear the perspectives of everyone involved because this is an incredible opportunity for the village of Arlington Heights, for the surrounding communities, and for the entire state of Illinois. And if we go forward, we have to get it right. And you can help us get there. So, so now I, I want to outline just a few basic facts, starting with the land purchase. In September of last year, the Bears signed an agreement with Churchill Downs for the purpose of acquiring the 326-acre parcel at Burlington Park. We remain Hotel, fitness center, a sports book, new community parks and open spaces. And if developed, it will be nearly a $5 billion project that can serve as an economic engine to provide benefits to the county, the surrounding region, and the entire state. 365 days a year. The construction period alone is projected to create more than 48,000 jobs and result in $9.4 billion in economic impact for Chicagoland, along with providing $3.9 billion in labor income to the workers across the region. It's going to be a long-term project, but even after construction, it's going to continue to create close to 10,000 permanent jobs result in $1.4 billion in annual economic impact to Chicago and another $600 million in annual labor income to workers across Chicago. We also anticipate that the development will generate $16 million in incremental annual tax revenue in addition to property taxes for the village of Arlington Heights. 9.8 million to Cook County and 51.3 million for the state of Illinois. Going to result in an increase in property tax revenues generated for the region compared to the property taxes that were previously collected on this site when it housed a racetrack. A couple more points. Regarding the stadium, there will be opportunities as we go forward, if we go forward, to, sh to share more details around that experience. But I want to share a few basic principles with you. The stadium will be enclosed. Why? Yeah.
Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ted. Why, why? You can answer this, but it hopefully can attract major events like the Super Bowl. College football players. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't have a facility like that now. That's what I read. Second, the capacity hasn't been determined, but our plan is for the capacity of the stadium, for the parking lots, for the tailgating <laughs> spots, all to increase compared to what currently exists at Soldier Field now. And finally, and in our opinion, most important, it, has, it will be designed to provide our fans with a first class experience that they deserve. More details will come. Um, we have a comp. I've never had so many claps in my life. I think I'll just stop right there. Um, we've accomplished and learned a lot, uh, but we still don't have answers to many of your questions. But what you will see is a preliminary vision. It will change, undoubtedly, if we do close on the land and decide to develop the property. We want to hear from you. We appreciate you being here, and we will incorporate your feedback, hopefully, into a more fully developed plan. So before I turn it over, let me, let me reiterate that our primary goal is to unleash significant economic and tax benefits to Chicago land with a stadium anchored <laughs> transit oriented mixed use development that will hold incredible value to the entire region and the state. Uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you for your uh, attention. I'll turn it over to Tanisha Bay. We'll talk about our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts that are important to us. Thanks, Ted. I'm glad to be here tonight to uh, spend a few moments with you all to share our organization's priorities related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our commitment to integrating those priorities into the Arlington Park project should we move forward. I'll begin with some background where we've been on our DEI journey for the Bears. Our long-term commitment began with the hiring an outside consultant to assess our organization and identify opportunities to improve and make an impact both internally and externally through our DEI office. Our work together ultimately led to a set of recommendations, including the creation of my role and the formation of the DEI Council. The Council's first priority was to develop a sustainable framework to serve as the foundation for our long-term strategy. This framework, which is briefly outlined here, was rolled out organization-wide in August of last year and centered around four primary focus areas with an emphasis on developing associated metrics to promote data-driven decisions and accountability. First one is workforce, which is our focus on recruiting and hiring qualified talent at all levels. Next is workplace culture, which is related to our efforts to support, develop, and retain our valued employees in an inclusive environment. Marketplace, who we're doing business with. As part of our efforts to expand our business outreach and increase market opportunities, we launched our vendor management policy, which included a commitment to DEI. Shortly after that launch, we began collecting data from our existing and prospective vendors so that we know exactly where we are, where we need to be, and what metrics we want to rely upon to hold ourselves accountable in reaching our goals. And last but not least is community outreach. Community service is a standing pillar of our organization and always will be. And through the lens of DEI, we continue to prioritize partnering with many communities we serve throughout, through outreach, programming, and philanthropic efforts. And those efforts positively impact thousands of individuals, children, and families each year. Our equity and inclusion in these organizational events and strategy a top priority if we move forward with this project in our We're committing to business enterprise and work alongside associated organizations and vendors on these efforts. We've already begun building relationships and forming partnerships during the close period, including hiring a minority owned law firm, minority women owned lobby firm, and a minority women owned community. Among um, plans to engage with a diverse group of partners in develop, development, including but not limited to organizations such as 
which is a nonprofit that connects women and minority-owned businesses with developers in the public sector, the Hispanic American Construction Industry Association, the Black Contractors Association, the Business Leadership Council, Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council, Black Contractors Owners and Executives Chicago, and more. The possibilities that a project of this historical scope offers on many levels is keeping the priority process is imperative and affords a significant opportunity to make a positive impact in our communities and ultimately meet and see our goals. We're committed to meeting the moment should this project move forward. And with that, we'll now hear from Scott Eagle with our Senior Research Department. Since we signed the purchase and sale agreement, we've been on a mission to learning more from not just the village, village of Arlington Heights, but also the region and, and the greater state. And uh, this is tonight is part of that process. We've also worked with a third party to conduct a couple polls, uh, both in January and July. The first poll focused on people that identified themselves as NFL fans and lived in the Chicagoland area. We tested awareness of the potential move to Arlington Heights and also the support or opposition of such a move. The second poll was conducted in July and focused on registered voters across the entire state of Illinois. Again, we tested awareness and then asked a little bit more about where the appetite was regarding public funding of any aspect of this project. And here's a little bit about what we learned. So in our first wave of polling, uh, when you look across residents of Chicago, non-Chicago, Cook County, and the Chicago land and suburbs, we can see support grow from roughly 50% in Chicago proper to almost 60% when you get to the suburbs. And this response is before any details of the project or the benefits have been made public. Opposition, you'll see, does not reach higher than 30% any of the specific reasons. And notice the gray areas at the top. Uh, those are the undecided, we believe, as we share more of the community benefits and economic drivers of this project there's opportunity to gain even more support for those who want to learn more. Um, our first poll also tested the likelihood of a fan's willingness to attend a game in a new stadium in Arlington Heights. Again, you'll see a very positive trend, starting with almost 60% of the people answering in Chicago that they would go, to growing to nearly 70% once you reach the suburbs. Those not likely to attend again, those numbers range lower than 27%, and those undecideds, again, the ones that want to learn more is in that 10 to 15 percent range. So as we transition to our second poll, which again, we conducted in July, uh, we began to take the sentiments of registered voters again across the state. So now we're getting a little bit larger of a cross section. So on the left, you'll see as we begin uh, incorporating residents outside of Chicagoland, awareness is not as high. That's not surprising. You can almost split it 50-50. And if a person has heard much about it or not about the potential move. But what we was very encouraging is nearly 70% of those who identified as her having heard about a potential move supported the idea. So even as we expand the voters across the entire state, the project remains popular to those that hear about it. On the right, you can see the strong support for Barrett's purchase in Island Park at about 45%. It was pleasantly surprising to see down at the bottom that only 13% were in opposition to the concept. And again, there's a very healthy amount in that middle gray area that certainly want to learn more before declaring an opinion. So again, there's tremendous opportunity given we're at the very beginning of our public education effort. Again, the biggest part starting with you all tonight. So finally, we have the general breakdown where state voters stand in regards to public funding of a new stadium anchor development. So nearly 70% polls supported some sort of public funding. Now that said, voters were most supportive of public funds going towards infrastructure, parks and green space, and less supportive of stadium funding efforts. And that falls right in line with our project, given the club is committed to funding the stadium construction. So overall, Early returns show there's an incredible interest and support for the concept we're presenting tonight, and that's before a general understanding of all the public, public benefits that come with it, which we're excited to share with you this evening. So we still have a lot to learn, 
We look forward to engaging the community further as we move forward. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Paul and Nicole from Higher Powerton, and they're going to take you through the master plan of our site. Thank you, Scott. Uh, my name is Paul Milana. I am a partner at Park Powerton, and together with my colleague, Nicole Emmons, we're very excited to be here tonight with you all to share our, our ideas for a vision for Arlington Park. Uh, and today is all about ideas, it's all about possibilities, it's all about potential, it's not about finalized plans, we don't have drawings ready for construction. And our firm was When the team started thinking about the possibility here, and as architects and urban designers, we, we went back to one of the best examples of American regional planning and town planning, which was the Plan for Chicago of 1909 by Daniel Burnham. And this was an amazingly far-reaching, bold plan that recognized the interdependence of the core and its environments and the interweaving of infrastructure in open space. This was the bold plan. It created amazing distance. And while not all of it was implemented, much of the way Chicago works today, and I think the culture of Chicago has been affected by the thinking that this place functions as one. And there's a quote that comes out of this plan by Mr. Burnham, which says, make no little plans, they have no magic. And later, Winston Churchill, would paraphrase that uh, in the time in the time when our world was going through a very tough time and we were as a team very much encouraged by this work this thinking we felt that we had a duty to uphold it in many ways and we kept going back to chicagoland and what does chicagoland mean of course i spent some time in this area and i had fond memories of that but we did an unofficial poll of all of our colleagues and friends who either grew up in Chicago or currently live in Chicago. We said, what is Chicago land to you? What makes Chicago special? And it sort of boiled down to these four categories. The first and foremost is that it's a tapestry of neighborhoods and suburbs. It's not one place. Uh, everyone said, I really love getting to know a new part of the region. It has amazingly iconic architecture and parts. We, we are taught that Chicago is the first city of American architecture. Um, many architectural in innovations uh, began here in Chicago. It has heartland values, uh, values, which mean that you all work very hard, but you also like to play hard. Um, and that extends into going out to a football game or a food festival or a concert. And of course, we all know, you know the amazing food that comes with the Chicago area. And then finally, it's a place for all seasons. I have a good friend who lives in Chicago that says, I love that I feel like I'm in a different city every time the seasons change. And so we wanted to create a place that honored these categories and really celebrated the Chicagoland spirit. 
Now, also, the site is uniquely positioned. Obviously, we're in the village of Arlington Heights, but it's really the nexus of three, of three different jurisdictions. Arlington Heights, Rolling Meadow to the south, and to the west, and Palatine to the north. It's also the... which is a tributary to the Des Plaines River, starts a little bit to the north in Palatine, and Wilkie Marsh continues through our rolling meadow in places like Kimball Hill Park, uh, through Bussey Woods Nature Preserve, and ultimately into the Des Plaines River. That was a huge opportunity for us. How can we honor that drainage? How can we enhance that drainage? How can we make that drainage part of what makes this site great? Now, of course, you all know too that this site has been in operation since the late 20s as a race track. And it's hosted many great events. Uh, it's hosted 35,000 people at these events, 15,000 cars. But it's a single use, it's one use. It has a very large grain when you look at it compared to the grain of the city uh, around it. And we, our firm has had the opportunity to look at two other racetrack transformation projects and we've been very fortunate. The one on the top is a place called Bay Meadows. It's in San Mateo, California, which is in the mid peninsula of the San Francisco Bay Area. And this site was a 93 acre mixed use development that provided, uh, along a transit line between San Francisco and San Jose, that provided much needed housing, much needed uh, commercial, much needed high tech, uh, high paying tech jobs in the mid peninsula. And it helped people stay local having to go to other areas to find work or housing. It also provided an enormous amount of new open space and connections to a part of the city where there formerly were no connections because it was occupied for one use. And then the project below that is Hollywood Park in Inglewood, California. And some of you may know that this is the new home for the Rams and Chargers. Um, but this was always much more than a stadium project. This was always a village project, and, and in many ways, Los Angeles is somewhat like Chicagoland. It is, a knit, knitted, it is knitted together by a series of villages that create a larger concept of what LA is. And so this project provided new housing, new employment, retail and entertainment, new parks, new civic, and it created it in a format that was walkable, something that Angelinos were desperate for, places that they could hang out, places that they could walk, they could push a stroller, bring their dog, bring their family, have a picnic. Um, and this community is now emerging and, you know, hosting events such as the Super Bowl and soon uh, the LA 28 Olympics, the opening and closing ceremonies will be hosted uh, in this, at this site in the stadium. But each of these sites are unique. They're tailored to their specific condition, to the culture of their environment and their surroundings. Uh, and we would never just import ideas from one place to another. We always try to find the, the element that is intrinsic and inherent in a location. So we start with the facts of the site. Uh, and that starts with how big is the site? Well, it's 326 acres. It's about a, more than a mile, just over a mile east to west, about a half a mile north to south. It's kind of a funny shape. It's sort of oriented on the diagonal along uh, Northwest Highway and the Metro Line. But then there are these circles which we've overlaid onto this site. And these circles are human dimensions. It's a way of counting neighborhoods, places that human beings feel connected to as part of their neighborhood. And these circles are a minute walk from center to edge, a minute walk from edge to edge. It's roughly a quarter mile from center to edge or half a mile across. So the site is actually two neighborhoods. And that was very important in the way we were thinking.
leads to St. Peter's Basilica from the Tiber River through the wonderful piazza and then into the basilica itself. You see that that all fits on the side. We also look outside of the site to understand what are those influences that starts with where neighbors are. When we look to the east and to the south, it's largely single family development. And when we look to the north and to the west, it's a combination of uh, institutions, civic, and uh, light industrial development. And the grain of those developments is very different. So how we, how we approach our edges, how we think about the distribution of land uses, how we meet our neighborhoods that adjust, that abut our site, these are all very important decision-making factors when we think about a place to create out of something of this size and scale. There's also the influence of transit. We're very blessed to have this uh, asset on the site. And transit has two zones of influence. There's the five minute walk zone, and what we've done is map that out relative to the length of the platform. And then there's the 10 minute walk zone. In the five minute walk zone, what we have found in our experience on transit oriented development design is that that is a zone that would be uh, appropriate and attractive for regional destination. People coming from other areas, taking Metra, want to walk about five minutes to get to where they're going. So that could include employment, that can, could include retail, dining and entertainment, could also include higher density residential. And then within the 10 minute walk zone, that's a zone that residents of a transit oriented district would feel comfortable walking back to the transit station. So we wanted to keep that in mind in thinking about how we disperse and distributed uses. Now, one exception to this walking distance is something like an NFL stadium. That is sufficiently uh, 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 important enough of a use where the, uh, pedestrians will walk much longer than a 10 minute walk. We've seen in other places people walking a mile, a mile and a half. Uh, to get to a stadium. We are well within that in our own site. And we, when we overlay that five minute walk circle on other transit uh, oriented developments, such as your own downtown, you see the grain of Arlington Heights changes within that circle. You get mix, a mix of more dense uses, higher density residential, commercial uses, and just outside that, you get uh, more of your residential neighborhood streets. Similarly, if you're familiar with uh, Market Square and Lake Forest, a similar pattern within that five minute walk, uh, mixed use development, retail, higher density, and then outside of that, residential neighborhoods. We also look at the geology and geography, and grading and drainage of the site, and all of those give us clues as to how to think about where uses go, where open space goes, where stormwater management facilities would go. And what we have is a site that generally drains to the center. So it's higher on the west to the center at, at Salt Creek, higher to the east, and then drains to the center at Salt Creek. It's somewhat higher along Northwest Highway and drains to the south. So there's generally this east to west drainage and north to south drainage. And you can see that the topography on the west side it's quite high. It's also enhanced by the elevation of Highway 53. The rail in that location.
major open space corridor elsewhere within the region. We anticipated that we would have an open space corridor on our side as well. And using that landscape as a connector to connect between the regional destination and the mixed use transit oriented development. And so, when thinking about locating a stadium on the site, the team, the entire team, when we, we got together and we looked at various options, all gravitated to the stadium on the west side with a mixed use transit oriented district on the east side, recognizing those two zones of influence, and then also recognizing that the view to downtown Chicago was also in that direction. So along the direction, generally parallel to the rail, generally parallel to Northwest Highway, is that view. And if, if you've ever been up in the grand, if you've ever been up in the grandstands or on uh, the Skyline Club, you know the view that you get of the skyline, which is it was really impressive view. Um, and with that, I want to invite Nicole to come up and take us uh, through the details of. is a vision and a framework for development. It needs to balance predictability and flexibility so that there can be a roadmap or a decision-making framework moving forward that would evolve over time as opportunities arise, allowing for what may come. On the screen now is an illustration of a vision that incorporates all the site opportunities, the knowledge we gain by looking more closely at the land that Paul just walked us through. The lessons from the successful transit-oriented developments in the area and across the country, and then thoughtfully organizes and arranges the uses, including a world-class stadium, into walkable, vibrant neighborhoods that connect to and can, can become part of Greater Arlington Heights <laughs> and Chicago land. To the west, the stadium district connects to the transit-oriented development to the east by a naturally occurring and enhanced landscape, a series of ponds and open spaces supporting site drainage, activities around Salt Creek, Greenbelt. Major entrances to the site occur from the Arlington Park Metro Station through a station square, along Milky through an entry park, and along Euclid through a landscape and open space. Additionally, the stadium district has access from the west and as well as along the extension of commuter drive. While we don't have details for the potential stadium, we have considered its attributes, what we know about stadiums and how they operate, the potential scale, how a mixed-use neighborhood might connect to it as well as the uses that complement a stadium and the activity of an event, while also supporting and being a place for the day-to-day -day activities of the residents and life within the development. We're going to have an opportunity to look more closely at the plan in a, in a bit. I'm gonna walk through some of the overview and then we'll have an opportunity to zoom in and show, share more with you. From the Arlington Park Station and its newly imagined station square, there's a diagonal street, you see it here in red, that's, a, that's imagined as a retail street with entertainment uses, a bear's fit, a sports book, restaurants, hotel, anchoring its west end, and then leading to a generous linear park that's on axis with a potential stadium and downtown Chicago. There are office and employment uses imagined within walking distance of the station connected by the continuation of commuter drive. Residential buildings transition from higher density multifamily within that five minute walk from the station to lower density, such as townhomes and smaller multifamily moving south and east to the site. Just as density and intensity changes and transitions, so will the building heights. With buildings closer to the station, Imagining similar to the transit oriented development that's in your downtown in Arlington Heights, typically four to eight stories. <laughs> With some of those buildings taller, like in Arlington Heights in the, in the downtown, taking advantage of the access to transit, taking advantage of the views, punctuating the skyline, creating its own skyline. Very nice. 
and becoming landmarks within the site development. Buildings will then step down to two to four stories as you move away from the station and into the lower density neighborhoods near the local roads. The plan also <laughs> considers and imagines locations for civic uses or neighborhood retail as part of the vision to create a vibrant and livable neighborhood, creating added benefit for the community. The potential mix of uses illustrated are knit together knit together and organized within an interconnected network of streets and open space. These streets and open spaces reflect a range of sizes and scales. These sizes of parks and open space are informed by their intended use and the use around them. They'll provide a variety of experiences for visitors, guests, residents, from more formal open spaces, such as the central green that you see on the axis with the potential stadium, to a more organic system of braided trails and ponds, enhancing the salt green, green belt running from the Wilkie Marsh to Bessie Preserve and the Des Plaines River, providing opportunities for hiking, biking, recreation, a variety of tailgating experiences like none other, and a dramatic setting for both the community and the stadium. Where there are opportunities to connect to the station or local roads and neighborhoods, there's a station square or Wilkie Park envisioned and envisioned along Euclid and connecting to the North-South Boulevard along Salt Creek, a system of ponds, creating a distinctive landscape abutting Euclid, creating opportunities for civic buildings and uses with significant and visible places within the site. Within the development, there may be neighborhood parks, opportunities for smaller parks, these open spaces are elements that provide for the necessary soil and water within the site. They're located where, normally, where water normally and naturally flows, as, as Paul showed in the topography, creating ponds that range from areas of open water to more native ponds with grasses and marshes. So a variety of experience. Each of these open spaces is an opportunity to provide a different experience, a connection to nature, to the community, to one another. While they function as part of the green infrastructure for the site, the landscapes are accessible. They can be accessed via walking or drive, places to sit, places to view, places to watch the seasons change and the park will change with the seasons. Places to even get in and on the water, just as some of the parks and the images here did. Other parks may be more active. These are places to gather and play and spaces that have the flexibility to be part of the experience of a larger event, such as an NFL game, a summer festival, a 5K, while also offering the recreation opportunities for daily residents, yoga in the park. The smaller parks and plazas are opportunities within the neighborhood for lunch with your coworker, you're at the office on Commuter Drive, great location for a playground for the children in the neighborhood. Or you might find that you have a favorite spot of bench to sit, watch the neighborhood slowly wake up on the weekends, wind down in the evening after you come home from the train if you have an office in the city. Streets are part of that network of open space, creating the framework for development. In the envisioning of the community, and a community connected to a larger community. We see opportunities to increase, to provide a primary network of streets with direct ways through and around the site. Opportunities not just for cars or bikes, but also for pedestrians. Walking through and around the neighborhood should feel comfortable. So the primary streets and their blocks are organized to create a walkable environment while also meeting the needs for the cars and the bus bikes and so forth. Secondary streets occur within the neighborhood. They're part of that network. They're providing more locally certain streets. They might be quieter. We're now gonna look a little more closely with Peter Lemon, the traffic and transportation engineer, who will provide more detail. Good evening. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Peter Lemon. I'm a transportation engineer working with the project team. And I want to take the next few minutes to walk through the transportation elements of the concept plan and highlight some of the aspects of our initial analysis. So from a transportation perspective, we're looking at both one, events related to, or events at the stadium itself, and two, the mix of uses that make up the balance of the site. So residential uses, uh, office spaces, restaurants, and retail, hotel, civic uses, and so forth. For the stadium district on the west side of the site, we're looking at a Sunday Bears game. For any traffic analysis, we focus on the peak hours representing the biggest periods for these, and for these events, that's the hour before kickoff and typically the hour following the game. However, not everyone arrives and departs in those hours. It's more spread out than that. People tailgate before kickoff. Um, people, there's pre and post event programming. And believe it or not, some people always arrive after kickoff. At Soldier Field and other similar venues, we found that typically approximately half of the, of the people attending the event um, arrive in the pre event peak hour um, before the game. Following the game, approximately two thirds uh, leave in that hour uh, following the game. Um, this is what we're factoring at, the, at this point, um, but post-event, we would expect that we would likely see it to be more spread out and less concentrated. Soldier Field is pretty isolated. This site would be able to take advantage of uh, the adjacent uses. People following the game might go to a restaurant or some of the other amenities uh, in the eastern portion of the site and start to actually spread out some of that traffic load. For a great majority of the year, when there isn't an event at the stadium, we're looking at the peak hours associated with residents commuting from their homes, uh, office workers commuting to the site for their jobs, um, people in the afternoon that are running errands. So for those types of analyses, we look at a weekday, weekday morning peak period and weekday evening peak period. We're also looking at a midday on a Saturday. Typically, it's sometimes between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. And that represents typically the busiest time on the roads on the afternoon and the weekends. When people are visiting restaurants, they're running errands, uh, attending their kids' sports games, things of that nature. So we're looking at peaks associated with both stadium and mixed-use uh, development aspects in the plan. In terms of access to and from the site, there's a range of modes and access options. People will be driving, people will be taking the train, the metro. Uh, there's bus options. So you'll see charter buses, uh, parking shuttle buses, uh, PACE, uh, PACE provides services to the area, uh, ride share, uh, so Uber and Lyft, as well as taxis, and people walking and biking. So I'm going to start with driving. The plan envisions a mix of new and current access points that are at the stadium. And just to orient you, uh, so you we spend our days looking at plans. Not everyone looks at plans like this every day. So at the bottom is Euclid Avenue. On the east is, is Wilkie. On the north is Commuter Drive, the railroad tracks, and Northwest Highway. On the west is uh, Route 53 and Rolling Road. And I'll start on the bottom of the screen towards the left. So the thing you see is the traffic signal and the, those uh, ring of circles. That's the main access to Arlington Park today. That's what most of us are familiar with as being the main access on Euclid with the gates that serve the park, and that will continue to be an important uh, access point for the overall site. What's not there now is a traffic signal. What would be there is a traffic signal. And I'll get into more of some of the other uh, improvements and aspects of those, but that's the, that's the main access on, on, on uh, Euclid. Continuing east, you see some of these circles representing where the neighborhood uh, streets come down to Euclid. And in the middle between those, uh, about approximately halfway between Wilkie and the main access is another intersection that we would expect to have a traffic <laughs> signal. This would lead up towards the metro station and through the mixed use uh, neighborhood. Currently around onto the east is a new, another new uh, intersection, approximately halfway between uh, Euclid and Northwest Highway and the railroad tracks. This would be uh, anticipated to be a signal as well to serve that side of the property as well as event related traffic and then the circle to the north of that that's the metro access that you see today uh, the one where uh, you know sometimes the traffic is backed up from 
from the, from the railroad tracks. We would be looking at some improvements there to uh, improve access into and also restrict how it turns out of there. I'll get into that, into that a little bit uh, further as well. On the north side of the site is Commuter Drive, which would be extended through the site from rolling and connect to the internal street grid. The railroad tracks have always been an access barrier to the site along Northwest Highway. To address this barrier and increase access via Route 53, a major access improvement in the plan includes two new underpasses that would uh, directly connect the ramps at Northwest Highway interchange under Northwest Highway and the railroad tracks to the south side at Commuter Drive on this site. Traffic would still be able to use the interchange and access, access Northwest Highway, but it would also have the option to continue underneath to or from the south uh, to the tracks on the site. With this, two interchanges, Euclid and Northwest Highway, can be fully used to provide access via Route 53, which we expect to serve the majority of the traffic coming from the site during events. Metro. One of the great assets for this site is its direct access to Metro at the Arlington Park Station. It provides an attractive access option that's a short walk to the stadium and it's adjacent to the mix of uses on the east. For a stadium, Metro is a great option to move from Chicago and those living along those communities along the UP Northwest Line. It's also a great option for event course to drive to the station, uh, a station down the line, and use Metro for the last leg of their trip to and from the site. The Metro station also serves as a magnet for commuting options for those who live and work in the area, hence the name Transit Arena Development. Buses. I mentioned earlier there's a range of bus options from charter buses to parking shuttles, pay service, and so forth. We've preliminary started to outline where those uh, pickup and passenger drop operators would go. Uh, with access uh, via the east and via the west, you'll notice that the area in the middle with the uh, pedestrian map, but that area is more clear for pedestrian movements to be one internally, uh, limit those conflicts between buses and uh, the pedestrian flows. Taxi and rideshare. Similarly, we've identified locations within the mixed use portion of the site east of the creek for designated taxi and rideshare locations where people would be dropped off and then post event uh, pick up their rides. Similar to places like O'Hare, so when you pull out your phone and you want to get into your room, there's a, a great network of trails surrounding the site, off-road paths, uh, and we would envision that this would continue. We would want to bring those and knit those into, into the site itself. In addition to using the pedestrian uh, street paths, we would have uh, designated bike trails. And the area that you see in the middle that's sort of shaded, and I'm, that's easy to see, it's in the park on a basis. So those streets would be closed, and you can see how this is So based on our initial analysis, we're working and we'll be working with the village of Maga and Cook County as we continue to uh, evolve this plan. I'm going to touch on these and I'm going to start on the on the north and kind of work our way clockwise around. So what you see is A, those are the underpass connections to the Northwest Highway Interchange that I mentioned, provide direct access to the site uh, underneath the tracks uh, to commuter drive. Moving east, uh, letter B, that's at the metro station itself. There used to be a pedestrian underpass there. We would look to either reactivate that or improve uh, to create a grade separated crossing so you're crossing over or under the tracks uh, so that people have access to the station platforms and you're not crossing the train tracks pre or post game at the track level. Around the corner, let's see, is the existing metro access. We've been 
improvements, and I mentioned restricting left turns so people aren't turning left out of there to go north. Um, anyone that is interested in doing that or in that direction, use the intersection that's further south on the block. Uh, that would have a traffic signal improvements as well. E, you put a uh turn lane improvements to increase capacity at the intersection, as well as uh, traffic signal improvements. And we would envision a coordinated signal system east and west on Euclid uh, to facilitate some of that traffic flow. F, this is the that would help facilitate event uh, related inf inflow and exit uh, movements. Similar at H, uh, median improvements, that's the intersection where the signal is currently at Salt Creek Lane. Uh, we would look at median improvements there so that we can fully utilize that median for uh, ingress and egress for events. I is the uh, northbound to eastbound ramp uh, at 53 to Euclid. Uh, and there is improvements to the shoulders so that we can actually use it for a normal two lanes during events. Uh, to increase capacity for flows uh, to the site. And J is on the other side of the interchange so that we would be able, if you're going um, westbound on Euclid and are going south on 53, you would be able to use the existing loop ramp and we would also be able to turn traffic south onto the southbound ramp onto 53 for increased capacity during uh, as we're letting out of events. And K is uh, improvements with the turn lane that's obviously a close proximity of the interchange to Hicks, uh, so it's capacity improvements at that intersection as well. So I'm going to turn this back over to Paul and Nicole to wrap up with the last few slides and wrap up our portion of the presentation. Thank you. So we thought now we'd be able to have a little bit of fun and give you an idea of the character of this place that we just described. If we a bit of light into the vision, uh, we know that there have been images of the proposal released to the press and everybody called them sugar cubes and we've heard a lot of different names, but um, in fact, we've been thinking about the look and feel. And again, these are ideas, these are possibilities, this is the potential. And when we think of a site that's 326 acres, it, it is necessarily going to be many things, have many textures, many experiences, from higher density uses, more regionally attractive uses, to lower density and more locally serving uses, a network of parks and open spaces, as Nicole took you through, uh, a network of event experiences, as we'll show you in just a few minutes. Um, and Nicole and I are going to toggle between showing you what fits within the five minute walk circle as we place it over different parts of the plan, and then what an experience within that might look like. Kitchen Square to the Central Green and, and south towards Euclid. First, looking at the area highlighted here, the retail area, imagining entertainment, retail uses along a diagonal street with outdoor areas that are ample for, for eating, for cafe spill out, maybe kiosks, game day, this would be pedestrian only on events, on large events as well. So places to go before, places to go after the game. The higher intensity uses, our short walk from the station, we've talked about the transit-oriented development and even looking at downtown Arlington Heights, where larger building footprints and their block size also accommodate structured parking. The Central Green is then an opportunity for views to the stadium towards downtown Chicago, as well as a place for activity. Within the station-centric five-minute walk, the mix of use a great variety. It's taking advantage of the proximity to transit, office, retail, residential, hotel. There's a, a large variety of uses 
a large variety of users. Everyone's walking through this collection site. If you're going to an event, or maybe you're headed home uh, towards the south, or you're, you're going out for a bite to eat, most of, a lot of people, if you're taking Metra, you're going to walk through the site and experience it. So to give you a possible look about what, how that might feel, um, this is a view overlooking Station Square. We're sort of hovering over the rail lines. You can see that the trains are in station. And we've arrived at this new community of Arlington Park uh, on a fall day, and they're having a farmer's market in that square. And that spills out onto the plaza with a new train station, in which you can see there is the beginning of that retail experience that Nicole just described going down that diagonal street, ending at a plaza with Bear Fit, Bear's Fit, the hotel, and that opening to the Grand Central Green, which leads to the view of the lakes mm. and the stadium beyond. And of course, this is a placeholder stadium. My favorite was it looked like an Apple, uh, Apple TV, but it's not a design. It's really just a, a bulk uh, placeholder. Um, and you see the diversity of experiences. You see the connectivity range in scale and heights, some of the taller buildings in the distance, maybe hotels that take advantage of the views over the parks, open space, views back to the stadium or back to the city, as well as some higher density residential. Now looking at the east, the streets and blocks are connecting to the local roads, existing neighborhoods. I'm thinking about hours and how we, we meet and greet, or you meet and greet this community. The smaller multifamily and townhome residences are more in that five to 10 minute walk. And they might be found around the neighborhood park. They might be found across the landscapes, landscape ponds and, and um, zone that's along Euclid. And again, the, the streets and blocks are scaled so that it's comfortable to walk as a pedestrian through the neighborhood. And so now we find ourselves on a Saturday afternoon uh, in a neighborhood park surrounded by townhouses and small multifamily buildings uh, with lawns and native planting uh, areas under shade grove of trees to meet your neighbors for a park. Families that come out with their kids in the pleasure uh, objects on a hot day like today would be a great thing to uh, play in places to bring your, your pets, uh, or just sit on the bench and read a book or take a break from what you're doing that afternoon. And these pocket parks and neighborhood parks would be distributed throughout the community, and each of them would be scaled and programmed for the uses that are adjacent to them, and whether those users are residents or maybe they are transient and they come in during the day for work and leave. So each of these would have a different um, and different programming. At the south entry at Euclid, many of you know it well, the Salt Creek um, there, there's an existing roadway boulevard entry into Arlington Park. That will be enhanced. So we have a, a larger group um, that then extends into, in some areas, large ponds that might be open water. They might be the native grasses. Um, again, there's an opportunity as you uh, drive into the site to meet and greet this new community. There could be residential across the pond. There might be some retail on the ground floor, maybe a, a cafe, a coffee shop that takes advantage um, and has a small area to sit and enjoy coffee, looking at the lake. And there might be opportunity to, to get in the water um, and enjoy the water. So this view is taken from that entry along Euclid, where we imagine a linear park that runs along these ponds. We're on a mm. boardwalk, which is projected into the lake itself. So when it calls it opportunities to get on the lake or out over the lake, um, we think this is a great opportunity. And we can see in the distance of Oak House, people in kayaks and canoes, paddle boats perhaps, um, really treating this as a recreational opportunity as well as a way that will clean the water clean up the site. Uh, that goes back into Salt Creek and ultimately into the watershed to the south. And in the distance, you see some of the taller buildings related to the Central Green, a hotel, perhaps a performance venue. And then uh, rounding out the other part of the lake would be the lower density residential buildings, as one 
approaches to southern entrance. And you can see on the left side uh, the hint of the new entry road, which would be a restored and enhanced entry. Uh, Salt Creek is actually running in that road. And then paralleling that road would be a series of parks and trails uh, that would uh, invite you into the community, into the park network that we have within the master plan. So now circling back to the west side of the Central Green and the threshold of the stadium. Uh, this west side of the Central Green is anchored by what we imagine might be the hotel, potentially a city such as a performance venue on either side. And then we imagine that the active uses of retail, such as bear spin. So that's a concept, a fitness concept um, that you have here in the local area, and there might be one here. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's where you can train like a bear. So um, sign me up. Um, so, <laughs> um, but we imagine that might spill out into the screen, those activities. And this this uh, central lawn is of a size that can serve the community, serve a class that wants to do an outdoor fitness class. And then on any given day, it's an active and interactive experience with pedestrian bridges that cross over the water, trails around the lakes and ponds, all of this connecting the community and the stadium through landscape. So now we're on a, an event day, and people are arriving for uh, for a great game. They just crossed the pedestrian bridges that Nicole just talked about. Across the ponds, you see people in paddle boats in the ponds, and in the distance, you see a hotel, perhaps with a great roof terrace that overlooks that central green, looks back to downtown Chicago, looks back over the pond network into the stadium, which will be just off of you to the left. Um, when you arrive at the stadium, there's a threshold, there's a plaza and, a, um, and a, uh, an area that would uh, encircle the stadium that would actually rise up and gives us the uh, opportunity to have a series of steps that people can sit on, people can look back over the, the ponds, look back over uh, the community and back toward the vista of downtown Chicago, as well as opportunities for tailgating, uh, for food. and then a variety of opportunities for tailgating. The experience of tailgating here would be like none other, all within that short walk of the community. Back toward the skyline of Chicago, you saw it in the foreground, the braided network of cons, uh, and open spaces and trails which surround Salt Creek and connect back to Euclid and then connect to the north as well. The two pedestrian bridges crossing the people arriving at the stadium plaza. Uh, the two pop-ups that you see in the lower right, one of them might be the entrance to the team store, one of them might be the entrance to the Hall of Fame. Uh, and then the central screen, which would be activated throughout the year and certainly on event days with uh, food tents, uh, perhaps a pickup football game. Um, perhaps the we would run through the, the bear arch. Uh, you see the mix of uses that line that green, which could include hotels, a performance venue, uh, a higher density residential. You see in the distance the 